Amen. Amen. Turn to two people and tell them, get a grip. Get a grip. Get a grip. Get a grip. As we were worshiping the Lord, and um, I'm sensing today that there's uh, already, if you were in your Pathways class and uh, just discussion that's gone on, that the, the Holy Spirit has already been speaking to us in many directions, and I appreciate those of you that were able to be there and be a part of, of what He's already doing, and, and I pray that the message always, always um, dovetails together. Dovetail is not a term that is used very much today because it's not a technique that is practiced very much because it takes extra time and effort. When you dovetail, and I, as you know, just kind of as a little hobby, I like to take pieces of furniture that aren't too far gone, just need to be re refinished and to, to strip off the old and put on the new. It's, it's always exciting to take off those old layers and see what's really the grain of the wood that's underneath of them. But I ask my wife not to bring home projects that need too much repair work. That need to be done on them. And uh, we look for, uh, especially the older furniture, that when they would put uh, dresser drawers together, they would dovetail the corners of them. They're much stronger. They fit together. Even when the wood over time, over years, over different environments that it's in, and the wood starts to bend a little bit and stress a little bit, those dovetails help hold that in place. But if you go and just want to do an easy, you just do a, a, a quick joint on the, on the corners of them, and those don't hold together as easy. They don't hold together over time. When the board starts to warp a little bit and dry out, it pulls away from itself, and there's nothing there that holds it. Folks, I want you to know, to live the life that God wants you to live, it takes the dove's tail in our life, if we could use that, and start to get a glimpse of the fact that we need the Holy Spirit in us. That does a little bit more work on us. Uh, turn to your neighbor and just say, mm-hmm. Uh, and he needs to work on us so that we just don't, just don't put together something real quick and put a couple nails in it, but that we fit together. It's a tight fit. It's something that when we start to stress a little bit, when you get bent out of shape a little bit, there's something that's going to hold us together. When, they, when there starts to be some pressure put against us, we're going to hold together. When there's an environmental change around us, and we start to either swell or we start to contract a little bit. There's something that holds us together. And it is by the dove, the Holy Spirit in our lives. It takes time. It takes more of a craftsman's desire than just something to quickly put out a piece of furniture at a faster rate. Make it look nice on the outside, but it's not going to last. I want you to know the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was meant to last. So we need to get a grip on what God wants to do. We won't take the time to, to, to actually go to this, the particular scripture. But back in the Old Testament, we were reminded, and I was just as we were worshiping the Lord there back in 2 Samuel, when, when, when David's mighty men of valor, and if you remember those men that David called by name, these are men that were faithful. Our whole series that we're on is on faithfulness. So I'm not, not getting away from the subject. I'm just bringing another little nugget into it. But these were men that were faithful, men that he could count on, men that were dependable, men that had proven themselves in previous battles so he knew he could trust them in the next one. And, they, and, and it says that the Philistines came up against them. An adversary, an enemy of the natural sense came up against them. But David and his mighty men of valor, I like the old, if it's okay with you, I'm going to use King James just a few moments. They defied the Philistines. I like that. I like that. It's time for the church to say it's okay to have some defiance in us, but we just need to know who we're defying. We're not fighting amongst ourselves. We need to understand there are still those that would be against us, but thank God the greater one's on the inside of us. But we still have to defy the adversary. I'm still looking for faithful men and women, kids and, and youth, that will stand up and say, you can trust me in the time of battle. I'm not going to run and hide. I'm not going to worry about my own hide. I'm here to be able to defy the enemy. And the wonderful thing is it starts to mention these men's names, these men of great valor that came and defied the, the Philistines. And this is the part I like in the old King James. It said that they fought all day long with their sword in their hand so much so that at the end of the day, after they won the fight, say they won. After they won the fight, the Bible says that their hand was welded to their sword. We jump over in the New Testament, we know that the Bible says that the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the 
word of God. Folks, we're going to have to understand that we're going to have to defy the enemy. And we defy the enemy best in faithfulness. We defy the enemy best when we take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, in our own hands. You need to, you know, some folks say, I'm just going to take this, thing, this matter into my own hands. Fine, but you better do it by the word of God. And they took that, the, that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and they started to, to, to go at the problem, and they didn't stop until they win. Would to God we had that kind of defiance on the inside of us. I ain't stopping until I win. I ain't stopping until I'm done. Well, I'm the one that decides when this thing is over, and I'm not over it. This ain't coming. You are not taking the word out of my hand, and you can't take the fight out of my heart and the defiance out of my life. And I've got, I'm hoping there's some guys around here that are with me that are fighting, but even if it comes down to just me, me and God, we're more than enough. One can put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. So me and God, we're more than enough. We need to get a grip on it, folks. I don't know if you've noticed, but life's getting kind of crazy these days. Problems seem to be everywhere that are around us, and we want to hide out if we're not careful as Christians. We want to just come and sing kumbaya and hope that everything's going to be all right. But I want you to know that there is a world out there that needs some Christians with some defiance on the inside of them, with the word of God in their hand, and they're ready to go forward and say, we will be mighty men and women of God. In this day and age, we will be mighty men of God. And we're not worried about about what's behind us, we're going to take on the enemy that is before us. We've been talking for some time, and that's just what guy got out of praise and worship today. I don't know what you got, but that's what I got. That we need to be working together in this world that we're in. We have a theme verse that we've been looking at for a couple of weeks. It'll be on the screen before us. You can write the reference down if you're fresh with us today, and it's Luke 16. 10 where Jesus said for unless you are honest in small matters you won't be lar- in large ones if you cheat even a little you won't be honest in greater responsibilities today we're talking about faithful in the hard times I don't know why I always have to preach sermons that nobody likes to say amen to but I, but they're true they're true this is true stuff folks This is what we call life, hard times, difficult times that we face. Genesis chapter 3, we want to jump back here and realize this isn't something new. Dealing with the hard times in our life, problems that that we have to come up against. We've got to learn how to be faithful in the little problems so that we can know that God's going to take care of us in the bigger ones and that people can be brought into our lives. This is where this really, this is, if you're in the advanced class, this is really where it goes. It's not about just dealing with the problems in your life so your life is easier. It is about learning how to deal with problems in your life so you have a proven ministry that you can help other people with. This isn't just about so that, this isn't just so some self-help program just on how to take care of your problems. Folks, this is how to take care of our problems so we can bring glory to God and we can help other people. Because I don't know if you've noticed it, people around you, they got problems. People in your family, they got problems. People you work with, they got problems. People you hang out with, they got problems. People you go to the club with, they got problems. People, People have problems in life. And our goal should never be just to get rid of the problems. Our goal should be to glorify God and to be an able, proven individual that can help other people with problems. Amen? And in this day and age, the church is not just some little hiding place where we come to and pretend like we don't have problems for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. This is a proving place. Well, we can prove that our God is more than enough. Where we prove the word of God is true. Where we have that word welded in our hands. And wherever we go, we're ready to use the word of God in our life. Faithful in the hard times, and we've kind of defined this as when we have pain caused by problems in our lives. Pain caused by, how many of you realize, how many got the revelation, problems have pain that come along with it? It's there. It's there. 
I'm not here to cause doom and gloom, and I'll say real quick here before, so if I don't have a chance to weave it in nicely later, I'll tell you this, God's not sending you problems. They're in abundance all around you. God's not sending, the only time, okay, I'll, I'll bring that back, the only time God sends you problems when you, when, when he, when, if you believe that children are a blessing of the Lord. We'll go on from there. We need, we need to learn to be faithful in little problems so that when, when, not just if, but when bigger problems come, we'll still stay the course. We'll still be faithful to God. We'll still be an example of his goodness and his grace. We'll still be able to help those that are around us. I'm going to read a portion of scripture here in Genesis chapter 3. This is right after uh, Adam and Eve have, have succumbed to the suggestions and the temptations of the devil. And he has tempted them. And he's brought them to a place now where they have, have yielded to his suggestions instead of God's commandments. And because of that, we see that there's going to be a change now in this place called paradise. It's now going to be a place that's going to be full of pain. It's going to be a place where there's going to be problems that are going to come this way. Before I read this, I want to make a statement and I want you to think about it. Now you're going to talk about it today, I want you to think about it. According to Galatians chapter 4, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law but not the curse of the fall. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, but not the total curse of the law. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I believe that or not. Anybody here have thorns in your yard that you didn't plant? Anybody find out that life's not easy, no matter how much you believe in God along the way? Now, thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the new birth come on the inside of us. But this earth, this earth has not experienced the new birth. This world, the God of this world system, is still Satan, who's causing problems. And, and even if it isn't Satan causing the problems, there's just people that have flesh that hasn't been saved yet. Amen? So let's read here, Galatians, excuse me, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. When the Lord saw, uh, said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all of the animals, domestic or wild. You will crawl on your belly, graveling in the dust uh, as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike at your head, speaking of what Jesus is going to do, and you will strike at his heel, speaking about the, 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 the pain that Jesus went through with paying for our sins. Verse 16 and when he had said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain in your pregnancy. I, I, I've never experienced this personally, but have gone through it with someone very close to me. And uh, it was, a, from what I could tell, a painful situation that she went through, having children uh, and, and suggestions she gave to me. And, and it says, <laughs> goes on, and in pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But he will rule over you. To the <laughs> Jay, that just wasn't even smart, man. That just wasn't that just wasn't even smart. Seventeen. Let's just read on. Read on quickly. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Doesn't mean God doesn't love us. Doesn't mean his spirit isn't on the inside of us. Doesn't mean he hasn't had promises for us. He's just saying, as long as you're in this world, life is going to be hard. Verse 18, it will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain, but, the, but by the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat and you will return to the ground from which you were made. God is saying here basically because of the choices that Adam and Eve made, the way, this is the way life is going to play out from here on out. This is the way it is. Now, I, I want you to know real quickly, it, you know, husbands and wife here, don't get all upset because of the scriptures that I just read. Because they need to be read in the light or with the glasses of revelation from the New Testament. Because even though it says that the uh, husband should be ruler over the wife, the Bible in the New Testament says, Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. 
That's the kind of love we're supposed to be ruling with, a love that is self-sacrificing along the way. And wives, before you get all uh, upset with your husband because he ain't everything you want him to be, or maybe he's more than he used to be, whatever the situation may be, I want you to know the scripture in the New Testament says, wives, honor your husbands above all else. See, we want the authority back here in the Old Testament without the responsibility of the New Testament. See, I preach these sermons and nobody says amen to along the way. You should note here as we've read through this portion of scripture before we go any further, it's interesting that God deals with the devil first, the source of the problem. The un- an amazing thing is after he deals with the devil, then he reveals the answer to the problem. He promises a redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to come and defeat the devil for us. And then out of his grace and, immers- and his mercy, he turns then to Adam and Eve and says, this is the problem you're now in. And this is the way it's going to go from here on out. We need to look at it because when we go through problems, who is the first person we look at? How this is affecting me. We forget to look that God already is aware of what's going on here and has already made promises before you had the problem. Please write that down. God always gives you a promise before you have a problem. There's always promises that have been given to us about what God desires to do, what he wants to do, his plan for our life, what he wants to achieve in our life, the things that he wants to bring to pass in our life. I'm just here to be real honest with you folks. Life is not going to be easy. I'm not going to tell you it's going to get easier. I'm just saying life is difficult, but God has a promise for every problem that we face along the way. And we need to understand that while we're here on planet Earth, we're going to go through problems. Too many times Christians, they get saved, they get excited about Jesus, they start coming to church, and then they start having problems. And it's like, what's the deal with this? I thought everything was supposed to be wonderful from here on out. No, you've got a Savior from here on out, but you're going to have problems from here on out also. This doesn't immune you from problems when you accept Jesus as your Savior. This last week, I've had probably at least three pastors that are close to to, to crash and burn in their life. People think us pastors got some kind of special force field around us, that we don't have any problems in our life. And yet, we need to understand we're human, we have problems, and we need to learn how to deal with them. Our, Our we need to understand that, that, that in one sense, this brings us together in a, in a common sense. Our commonality, though, you see, goes deeper than just DNA that brings us back to our mom and dad through Adam and Eve. We have a commonality. We have something that pulls us together that is, that, that is beyond that, folks, that every one of us have to deal with. And that is that we all have problem i don't i don't care if you're rich or poor i don't care if you're black or white i don't care if you're latino or filipino i want you to know you're going to have problems in life i don't care if you're single or married i don't care if you're divorced or remarried you're going to have problems in life i don't care if you're recently uh, uh, widowed or if you're on the prowl you're going to have problems in life I don't care if you you wish you had kids, if you wish your kids would go to bed, or if you wish the kids would come by more regular. You're going to have problems in life. And excuse me for just a moment, but I just want to say whether you're straight, whether you're, you're, you're gay, whether you're confused, or whether you're not, they just haven't identified what you've got going on right now, you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems in your life. We think that if we are something else, or if we were somebody else, that we wouldn't have problems. But folks, we all have problems. And those problems, those problems cause pain in our life. And we oftentimes want to get away from the pain instead of just dealing with the problem from a biblical perspective. We need to understand that we're not here, and I, I mentioned earlier, we're not here just to numb the pain so that you can replace the need of a Savior for some kind of an addiction in your life. And I'll just be honest, I'm not even here to tell you that you, that some magical way that you can go through the rest of your life without problems. But I can tell you there is a divine supernatural way to deal with every problem that you face in your life. So, the interesting thing I thought as I was preparing for this message is that oftentimes Christians seem to be able to deal with the, the persecution 
of a, of a spiritual force, a demonic force to rebuke or to, to exercise or whatever it might be. It seems that some Christians find it easier to deal with the persecution from a spiritual force than it is to deal with the problems of humanity that are around them. People are imperfect. This world is not perfect. And I know it's the effects of sin and it's the effects of the devil. But folks, every one of your problems is not a devil. I wish it was because you could just rebuke it and take authority over it. Not every one of your problems is a devil. There's not always a deeper reason why this happened to me. Folks, sometimes it's just, it's just not that deep. It's a problem. We just got to deal with it. It's not necessarily always the devil after you in life. Sometimes it's just the effects of Genesis 3. Life is difficult. Life is hard, but we're going to stay faithful in the hard times. We're going to stay faithful in the problem times. Turn quickly over into the New Testament, and we're going to look at a couple of scriptures real quickly here. We're talking about being faithful all the time. Gen we're looking at as some, one most of you can quote, but let's look at it. Make sure you got it in your Bible. John 10.10. 10. John 10.10. 10. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some people always want to hear, Pastor, I just want to hear an uplifting message. Well, here's an uplifting message for you. You're going to go through problems, but you're more than a conqueror. Well, no, 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 Pastor, I don't want that, that first part. I just want the second part. Folks, you can't be more than a conqueror if you ain't conquering something. Getting out of bed is not really supposed to be the biggest thing you did that day. We are to be a defying force against the kingdom of darkness that is around us. That is sure. But we're also supposed to be a light to those that are around us. We're also supposed to be hope to those that are around us. We're supposed to be able to share with people. Because how many people come up to a Christian and say, you just don't understand what I'm going through? I might be able to say, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I know I've been through some stuff. And I want you to know when I was in it, I didn't like it, but thank God I got through it. And there's only one way you're going to get through it. And that's with the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. There's only one way you're going to make it. There's only one way you can get through these things. And that is to know the Lord. That's why we've got to be real with people that are around us. We're not walking forward saying we've never had a problem in our life. I've never. You know, I, 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 oh, it was wonderful one day. Where you, you know, you have one of those dear little children of, of God. I uh, had a fellow friend in Bible school. And uh, he was on this amazing pedestal. He was, uh, he was telling everybody just how much he'd never had alcohol touch his lips. Never. Never had alcohol even touch his lips. It's like, well, you know, did you not inhale? But anyway, I mean, what, what is the, he didn't even touch his lips. And then the, it wasn't much longer that he started talking about him and his, his wife had gone out to one of the restaurants in town there. And then he was telling us it was one of the nicer restaurants at which us college students never go out to the nicer restaurants. But him and his wife had some decent jobs, and they went out to the nicer restaurant, and they just loved the daiquiris there. And, and so, so there was a few moments of us just saying, dude, you're dumb. But, uh, <laughs> but just a few moments there where we're like, I know you did it out of ignorance, but there's, did, you, did you get the virgin ones, or did you get the, just the regular ones off the menu? Oh, just the, those have alcohol in them. Oh, my goodness. We thought the guy's salvation had just about left him because he no longer had this testimony of alcohol never touching his lips. Well, folks, I want you to know that your pastor is not a living alcoholic by any means, but I'm not perfect either. But I want you to know Jesus is faithful even when we're not perfect in our life. And maybe, maybe you've had alcohol touch your lips here today. And when as Jorge said, don't raise your hands, all right? Don't raise your hands on somebody. <laughs> maybe you've had problems in your life. Maybe, you, you, maybe you've done stuff that you hope no one's ever known. Maybe you've done stuff and everybody knows. Really doesn't matter. It's what are you going to do from this point forward? What are we going to do to turn our problems that we have into a testimony of the presence and the power of God that can transform our lives? It's not just about my problem. It's about what God can do to renew my life. I'm not making small of, the, uh, of that gentleman. And, and if, you, if you've never had alcohol, praise God, there's a lot of things I hope we never do. And I'm not saying you've got to go through those things. But don't allow your testimony to be what I've never encountered. But may our testimony also be what God has brought us out of. 
and his sustaining grace and power in our life. Jesus here gives us hope. In John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief, the devil, does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. And I understand that. And yet every problem in my life is not the devil himself knocking on earth. He is not God. He cannot be everywhere at once. He has limited resources on his side. So, folks, sometimes problems that are happening in our life, sometimes they're not the devil. Sometimes it's not demons. Sometimes it's not, you know, just directly an attack of the enemy. Just because bad things happen doesn't always mean the devil's the one that did it. Sometimes it's just living in a fallen world with lots of sharp objects around us. Jesus here, his focus was, was yeah, the devil's there doing this, but, but he said the real focus is I've come to give you life. Please write the word down if you need to, life, and then put Z-O-E beside it, zoe. It's the Greek word for abundant, eternal life. Jesus is saying that in this life, there's, there's death, there's, there's theft, there's destruction. And I've come to give you life in the midst of all of this darkness, in the midst of all of this hopelessness, in the midst where, where Satan is, and his, and his forces are, are causing so many problems and the residual effect of them that, that goes out from it, that's going on in this world, it, in spite of all of that, I've stepped into that. And in the midst of all of that darkness and all of that theft and all of that death and all of that destruction, life's right here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm here to defy the darkness. I'm not here to start a religion. I'm here to, de to, to defy the enemy. I'm here to be more than a conqueror. I'm here to, to share with other people that you can have this new nature that lives on the inside of you, that you can step into the chaos of this world also and still have life on the inside of you. You can have the life of God, the nature of God that is greater, that starts now. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to start to experience supernatural peace in your life. You can have it in the midst of the storms of this life. You don't have to wait till you get to pearly gates and, and gold streets to be able to, in the midst of a place where there is lack and there's not enough, to be able to look to God and say, my God is more than enough in my need and he will supply every need that I have in my life. We don't have to get to a place where the choir of angels are all singing to be able to offer up right in the midst of the enemy me a sacrifice of praise the fruit of my lips giving thanks unto my God in the midst of death darkness depression all of this hopeness all this wrong stuff that's going on that God can invade it through invading us and we are not running from the problem if anything we should be saying where are problems a quote that I had heard a long time ago it said, for every, the answer for every problem is a person. I thought, how wonderful that is. A couple weeks ago, I walked into the, uh, the worship room just beforehand, and we were talking a little bit, and, I, and this thought just kind of came to me. The answer to every problem is a person. And the cause for most problems are people. <laughs> people. Dealing with them. So if I'm going to not go beyond just trying to solve my life problem, if I'm going to help others, folks, then to help others means I've got to encounter people who have problems. And people with problems are in pain. And they need us to have more Jesus in us than the problems that they're facing. We've got to prove this thing in our lives so we can take it out and help other Folks, this is, this is the, the, the dilemma that I'm working with today. This is really all about getting you into ministry. This is all about not ministering to the saints, but through the saints. This is all about us realizing that, that my pain, my problem, is not my identity. It, 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 my, who I am in Christ Jesus is my ident identity. And that I must turn this around so that I have a testimony to be able to share with the world that are around me that the Jesus that's in me is greater than what comes against me. Jesus is focusing here. He's saying, 
You need, I, I've come to give you life and that life more abundantly. That we can start in us right now and then it starts to flow out of us and it goes for eternity. His focus is on his divine nature in us. But folks, I hear too many Christians saying, I just want to be happy. I want to be happy. I want to be happy. Happiness is a feeling, folks. Happiness is a feeling. If you're chasing a feeling, folks, that, that thing's hard to get hold of, and it's even harder to hold on to in your life. You'll be chased for things that you want. What makes you happy? Usually it goes back to a fleshly, carnal desire. What I want. What I want. Instead of saying, God, what makes my life pleasing to you? You see, we need to learn these things. How to, we need to learn how to deal with our problems. We need to, in some situations, I'll explain this real, real quickly. Some situations, we got to learn how to live with our problems. Thought I'd get a couple of amens out of that one. We got to learn how to live with our problems. But we should never be controlled by our problems. There's some things you're... Some things are, if problems are caused by people, there's some problems you're not going to change. But you need to learn how to live in the midst of some of those things and be greater than the problem and the pain that is around you. If you go and change your job every time you've got a problem, folks, you're going to be unemployed real quick. Huh? If you're going to just only stay married to someone who's perfect like you, you're going to, you're, people aren't even going to, you're not, you're not even going to get asked out. We need to understand, folks, that in this day and in this world that we're in, that there are problems all around us, but we need to stop and say, God, how do I control this? How do I learn to deal with it? How do I learn to live in the midst? We need to grow up. We need to be prepared for problems. We need to be willing to help others with problems. We need to stay faithful in the problems. Oh, I just stopped coming to church because everything was just falling apart in my life. Wonderful. So the boat starts to go down, so you jump overboard without a life vest. Is that wise along the way? Stay faithful to God along the way. There are people around you that need real help, folks. They have real problems. And they need real love, real help. They need Jesus, and we have Jesus in us. We have Jesus with us. We are dovetailed together with him. And we need to be able to share with the world that are, it is around us that we can be faithful when tough times hit us, when tough times come against us, hard times, painful times, times where problems come into our lives, that we can still look to God and say, I'm going to stay faithful to you along the way. It releases us into a ministry. We're not always looking just for the answer, but we're looking to Jesus to help us along the way. Isn't it interesting? Quick, really turn over to, to John's Gospel, chapter 16. In the ministry of Jesus, there was times he would rebuke the waves and the wind and they would be gone. There was other times when there would be a great storm and Jesus would just walk on the water in spite of the storm. Are you just looking for a calm day before you get out of the boat and start walking on the water? Are you just looking for everything to go perfect in your life before you start to do what God has put on you in your heart to do? And that is to minister to the broken hearted. Ministering to people that are, well, pastor, I don't know anybody that's, that, 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 that's hurting, that has problems. If they're rich, they got problems. If they're poor, they got problems. If they're black, they've got problems. If they're white, they've got problems. If they're Latino, they've got problems. If they're Labuda Mariate, they got problems. If they are are. are are, are sexually confused, they've got problems. If they're straight, they're can problems. If they're gay, they have problems. Folks, people have problems. We just need to be caring enough to say, share your problems with me because I know someone that can, can, can minister life to you. It's not about me being able to counsel that problem out of them. It's me taking them to Jesus who is able to help them along the way. Jesus tells us this in John's gospel. Jesus says this in John 16, 32, 33. He says, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, but has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own. But this is a powerful statement. 
and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Because the Father is with me. Because the Father is with me. In Jesus' most intense problem moment, when everybody left him, when everyone seemed to be against him, and we know, of course, there was demonic influence, of course, here in the situation, but folks, the crowd just got whipped up against him just because. Just because. At that moment, he sensed the presence of his Father. And he said, that's enough. That's what I needed. He goes on here in verse 33. These things have I spoken to you. That in me, in me, in me, you will have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Folks, he's forewarning his followers. In this world, you'll have tribulation. But first of all, he has a promise before he talks about the problem. In me, you'll have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Isn't that amazing? He has, gives us a promise. He tells us what the problem is going to be. And then he tells us how we're supposed to behave in the midst of it. Be of good cheer. He didn't say, be happy. He said, be of good cheer. Do it. Do it. Don't have my, knock in my Nikes on today, but do it. We just got to do it. Well, pastor, I don't feel like it. Do it anyway. Pastor, I, I don't feel like coming to church. Do it anyway. Pastor, I don't feel like helping someone else. Do it anyway. When we realize that we are never alone, when we understand that our feelings do not control us, my goal is not to feel happy. My goal is to be an example of the power of God that's on the inside of me. That Christ is alive in my life and I will follow him. That we then start, you know, uh, name the problem, that's okay. But folks, we need to claim the promise of God that goes along with it. We need to name the problem, but claim the promise. Oh, or pastor, are you one of those name it and claim it? Yep, right there I just said it. Name the problem and claim the promise. Well, I don't know if I go along with that. Then stay stuck in your feelings. Stay controlled in your mess. Stay feeling bad right where you are. Okay, we'll just take it a step further since you ain't saying amen today anyway. Just go ahead and be a testimony of the devastating power of Satan. Just go ahead and be an example of a defeated Christian. Just go ahead and be another witness to this world will whip you if you don't stand up for Jesus. Yeah, you're starting to amen me now, aren't you? We want to turn this thing around. We're going to be faithful in hard times. I'm ready for hard times. I'm ready for hard times. I'm ready for hard times. Not believing for them, not asking for them, but I ain't going to run from them either. I'm ready for hard times. They're, they're, you know, people may be against me, but we're going to go forward. People might not be cooperative, but we're going to still be conquerors. Well, well pastor, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult. It's always uphill. But folks, we ought to go up with, we ought to have dirt under our fingernails from climbing up that hill that we say is difficult in our life. And rename that, di that difficult hill. Say, that's my hill. That's my testimony. That's my way. I, I'll have some selfies from me up on the top of that hill someday. And it might take me a while to get up there, but I'll be up there someday. I'll be there. I'll go up that hill. Take some nice pictures. Take some nice pictures. I'll get an angle so I can get some from you back down there. Where, eh. What are you going to do in hard times? Sometimes we need to learn to live with it. But that means being an example of Jesus to those that are around us. Sometimes we got to deal with it. And there's some promises from God's word that we put into practice and we just, we deal with that situation. And we don't stop until we're done. But we will not allow it to control us. Regardless of how difficult it is in our life. My goal is not to live without problems. My goal is to be a witness of his glory. And to be a help to others that have problems. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.